Monarchy is an institution as old as civilization itself. From the divine rulers of the ancient times to today's constitutional figureheads, monarchy has shaped and developed our world. Join me on a journey into the heart of this age-old institution where we unravel the mysteries of monarchy. We'll explore its deep-rooted connections to power, law, religion, and the very fabric of human civilizations. Monarchy has been scrutinized by many specialists over the last decades and centuries from multiple disciplines. Yet, to all of them, monarchy remains a mystery. To truly get to the essence of monarchy, we must come through these different perspectives and put them into a cohesive story. Now, let's go through nine pivotal elements that form the backbone of monarchy, arranging them into three concentric circles. Circle one, power, law, and religion. These are the bedrock of monarchy, shaping the monarch's fundamental role. Circle two are ceremonial representation and display. These elements articulate the monarch's relationship with elements of the previous circle, power, law, and religion, broadcasting their role to dynasty, court, and realm, that are parts of the circle number three, and these represent the monarch's domain, the stage upon which they enact their rule. At the heart of these circles lies the crown, a potent symbol where all elements Converge, defining the monarch's prerogatives and limitations. So let's first talk about power, law, and religion in more detail. Of course, after liking this video, sharing it, and subscribing to channel to help its growth. The concept of power is intrinsically tied to monarchy. At its core, a monarch is one vested with authority over people and land. This person is often perceived as the most significant and powerful individual in the realm. But does that reality always align with assumptions? While it's easy to picture monarchs wielding immense powers like the Tsars of Russia, there are also figureheads like today's constitutional monarchs who reign more in ceremony than in action. This notion isn't actually new. Over 2,000 years ago, the Huai Nan Tzu, an ancient Chinese text, preached the value of non-action for emperors, advocating for leadership through serene inactivity and delegation. On the other hand, Catherine II of Russia championed the idea of the sovereign as an absolute leader, a central figure upon whom all authority is rested. This spectrum of power, from passive figurehead to autocrats, has sparked endless debates among political terrorists throughout history. The question is, where does this power originate from? It often stems from law, like succession rights, or religion, like divine selection. These aspects not only grant legitimacy, but also form the cornerstone of a monarch's authority. Charisma plays a role too, often seen as divine. Max Weber described it as a unique quality setting an individual apart, endowed with extraordinary, even supernational abilities. This concept of being set apart is visible in the stronger king notion found in various cultures where a monarch is often seen as a foreigner or outsider the divine connection ranges widely some rulers were deemed living gods like the egyptian pharaohs while others like charles iii of uk have a more symbolic religious association The line between divinity and humanity often blurs, with rulers claiming divine ancestry or representing the divine on earth. In some cultures, monarchs have even believed to possess magical abilities, like the Lovedu queens of Africa known for their mystical control over the weather. 
However, this divine association wasn't without perils. Natural disasters or poor harvest could be blamed on the ruler's failure, leading to potential dethronement or worse. This intertwining of monarchy and religion is profound. A monarch can embody both a secular and a religious figure, like the British monarch who is both a state and a church head. However, the clear boundaries do exist. Kings are not priests, and priests are not kings. Kings are made by priests who represent both the people and some divine or transient force. There has also been conflicts, particularly in Christian Europe over whether the power of the church or the ruler is supreme one. Law is the other pillar of monarchy. Kinship and law are inseparable, and the ruler's primary role is to uphold justice. The fixation of the idea of the just king and the ruler as the upholder of justice was hardly unique to European or Christian concept of monarchy. Islamic mirrors for princes also focused on the role of the ruler as the upholder of justice and linked this function closely to religion. These texts demonstrate that the embodiment of justice is the ruler and that administering justice was the instrument to successful rule. Monarchs are bound by strict court protocols and expectations. The often incredibly restrictive confines of court protocol also hedged monarchs with rules for their behavior and tight framework for their activities. The combination of meeting the expectation of kingly behavior and adhering to court protocol made ruling itself even more challenging. Yet rulers who fail to meet the lofty expectations of their subjects or adhere to the structures of appropriate behavior for monarch risk the removal from power by being dethroned. And now let's turn to the world of ceremonial representation and display. Ceremony lies at the heart of monarchy, intrinsically woven into the fabric of a ruler's duty to harmonize the realm with the divine. These rituals not only reinforce the monarch's role, but also mark their transition from mere mortals to a realm of semi-divinity. Ceremonial and ritual underpin and affirm the monarch's role. Clearly, coronations, or the ceremonies that mark the ascension of a new monarch, are a key moment where the heir transitions into that separate status positioned outside normal society to which their peers and subjects belong. The amount of time that the monarch was required to spend performing rituals could impact their ability to function politically, turning them into a more of a reigning monarch whose primary task was to oversee ceremonial instead of being an active ruler. And this is seen in the historical examples like the Japanese emperors who were deeply connected in a perpetual cycle of rituals, the Nanju Goji. Today, the essence of monarchy is often encapsulated in its ceremonial nature. In our postmodern world, the ceremonial monarchy thrives, a reflection of both the decentralization and democratization of this ancient institution. Representation and display are two important means of communicating majesty, visually underlying the power and authority of the monarch. This can not only be done through ceremonial, but also via the outward appearance of the monarch, both in person and what is communicated in portraits, statues, seals, coins and tombs. This isn't just limited to grand ceremonies, but extend to their personal portrayals. These images are not mere art. They are powerful statements of authority and legacy. The coronation itself is a visual spectacle. The sovereign is adorned with regalia, each piece a symbol of their right to rule. 
crowns, orbs, scepters. These aren't just ornaments, but sacred emblems of authority resonating through time and culture. This display of power and legacy extends beyond the monarch's lifetime. Just look at our Habsburg knocking ritual. Monarch's tombs are not just final resting places, but enduring testament to their reign and ideals. These memorials, ranging from the modest to the monumental, like Cheops Pyramid, are last declaration of the monarch's influence, speaking to both their subjects and to history itself. In every coin, portrait or tomb lies a story, a piece of the monarch's narrative reaching out to us across time, echoing the grandeur and the solemn duty of their reign. And finally, let's navigate the interconnected realms of dynasty, court and realm, the foundational elements that shape and sustain monarchies. The dynasty, often seen as a bastion of support, can also be its own undoing. Interdynastic rivalries, fueled by the potential for many members to claim the throne, can lead to families' downfall, paving the way for new dynasties to rise, or republics. This complex dynamic revolves around the critical act of designating heirs. The method vary, some choose based on age, ability or favor, others, like in many Arab monarchies, leave the decision to the current ruler. However, this can breed discord, highlighting the need to clear succession laws for maintaining harmony within the dynasty and regulate accession. Succession principle often involve bloodline proximity with models like primogeniture or collateral lines taking precedence. Yet beyond bloodlines, some monarchies opt for election, choosing a ruler from outside the dynastic circle. To get a better idea, check out the video on rules of succession on TMC. Despite the potential for division, dynasties can also embody cooperation. The concept of corporate monarchy suggests a collaborative effort among family members, including mothers, wives, and siblings, all working together for dynasty's continuity and their realm's stability. Transitioning from the intricacies of dynasty to the grandeur of the court, we find the monarch's stage. Palaces, beyond their architectural magnificence, serve as a key ceremonial venues and symbols of monarchical image. The palace location is a subtle yet powerful statement about the monarch's relationship with the realm. Some rulers choose urban settings, embedding themselves with the capital, the heart of the kingdom. Others, like Seljuk rulers of Central Asia, preferred extra-urban or even nomadic setting using space to emphasize distance and authority. The concept of mobility was not unique to the Seljuks. Medieval German kings and even Elizabeth I of England exemplified rulership on the move, engaging with the realm through journeys, showcasing their presence and partaking in rituals all across their territories. In this triad of dynasty, court and realm, we see the multifaceted nature of monarchy, a complex interplay of family dynamic, ceremonial grandeur, and the delicate balance of power and presence within the broader realm. As we draw our exploration to a close, let's reflect on monarchy not just as historical institution, but as a living system continually evolving within society we live in. Monarchy transcends being mere symbolic. History has shown us monarchs like Elizabeth I and Victoria of Britain, who became not only the face of their nation, but icons of entire eras. In the dawn of the 20th century, monarchs were often the focal points of nationalism, embodying continuity and consensus, their regal presence a rallying point for a national unity. Yet, there is an increasingly personal dimension to monarchy. 
The visibility and openness of modern monarchs create a sense of familiarity, an illusion of personal connection that was once unimaginable. This shift brings both opportunities and challenges. As the traditional separateness essential to monarchy is at risk being diluted by this increased accessibility. Monarchs today must navigate a dangerous path. On one side, balancing the preservation of age old traditions with the need for modern adaptation. They must remain relevant, aligning with contemporary social norms while maintaining the dignity and distinction of their role roles. In today's world, titular monarchs are abound. Their roles are more ceremonial and symbolic than authoritative. They often remain intertwined with religious traditions, participating in ceremonies and maintaining a level of representation and display. However, their power to enforce law or exert political influence is markedly diminished. And within this context, dynastic stability becomes challenging. We witness disputes over titles devoid of real power, further eroding the monarchy's residual influence. As we have seen, for example, in Georgia, where even the president is for monarchy, but dynastical fracturing is the major obstacle to restoration. Surprisingly, without any real effort or campaigns, monarchies retain a significant level of public support, often rivaling the trust people place in republics. So what have we learned today from this journey through the intricate world of monarchy? We've seen its resilience, its adaptability, and its enduring appeal. But we also recognized its vulnerabilities in a rapidly changing world. What are your thoughts on the future of monarchy? How do you see it adapting, surviving, or perhaps even thriving in the decades to come? Let me know down in comments. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, as well as consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.